Good evening and welcome to Pacific Northwest Sculptors virtual reception for Emergence, our first virtual show of sculpture. I'm Chaz Martin, president of Pacific Northwest Sculptors, and I'm pleased to welcome uh, about a third of the 60 participants whose work was included in the show, plus our juror, Richard Spear. For those of you who are unaware, I'll just do a quick overview. Uh, Pacific Northwest Sculptors is a group that's been around for, uh, I believe we just passed the 20 year mark. And unfortunately we didn't share it because there wasn't any way to, to get together to, to share. Uh, we're approximately 90 members, mostly in Oregon and Washington, but we have a couple in France and a few scattered throughout the country. Um, being virtual has opened up a lot of new relationships for us, which has been really good. Uh, we were founded by um, a group of pretty high power sculptors in the region, uh, some of whom are still participating, most of whom have become too famous to, to hang out with us anymore. But we wish them all well. The reason the organization was formed really was to share knowledge, which is what most of us do. It's a very eclectic bunch from um, some folks right out of school to uh, some people selling work internationally. And we share resources, knowledge, connections, uh, whatever. Anyone interested in joining is certainly welcome. Uh, membership is open to everyone. Uh, part of the reason uh, the group was formed was uh, not just to share knowledge, but also to appreciate or to uh, increase the appreciation for sculpture in general. We thought emergence was vague enough that it could be interpreted any way anyone wanted. So that's the that's the hot potato that we tossed to Richard when it was time to uh, time to deliberate the show. Uh, just to give you some some parameters. We had uh, we we promoted the show nationally. We had 532 pieces of art submitted by 144 artists in 32 states. 60 artists were included in the show. Oddly enough, no members of Pacific Northwest Sculptors made the cut. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> so. I did not influence the juror, and maybe I should have. The goal of the show was to um, just extend the reach and visibility of our group and also to just expand our connections and relationships and um, see what happens. So before we go too far, I want to I want to share something and then um, I'll move on. I'm just going to jump on this really quickly. I was in a conversation earlier today with um, Hang on just one second. Uh, with Scott Price, who's off, also online. Okay, so uh, we're in conversation with Scott and uh, in another company to help us render our sculptures in 3D. This opens up a whole new world of how we can display art, which uh, really excites me because as you all know, when you're submitting a two-dimensional piece, um, you you know, a two-dimensional image of a piece, you don't really get the whole feel. So I think this is going to open up a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities for how sculpture is seen in the future. Um, if you're interested in following any of that, that'll be we'll be um, probably updating our newsletter with information over the next few months as as this project develops. Uh, we're probably looking at uh, something big to to share with you by spring. Emergence is a theme that everyone interpreted differently. And I'm going to pass this on now to Richard and let him talk about how he viewed the show, what he chose, uh, what his thinking patterns were. And then after Richard uh, gives us some insights, uh, hopefully all of our award winners are here. Uh, I'll let each of them talk about their piece. Richard is a, as a, as a, an author, a curator, an art critic. Uh, he was the art critic for Willamette Week, which is a regional newspaper. He's moved on to bigger and better things and published uh, several books as well. So Richard, welcome. Thank you very much, Chaz. Uh, hello to everybody. It's nice to see you. Um, and thank you for participating. Um, I 
really enjoyed the process of going through uh, when Chaz told me that there were you know more than 500 artworks to look through I thought wonderful uh, that there's nothing I like more than looking at a very diverse broad uh, coalition of artwork and uh, you know as Chaz mentioned and as you probably know from a lot of themed shows yeah it is vague uh, it is a it does allow for a lot of interpretation. I think that the emergence is kind of about where we all hoped to be and, you know, emerging from this damned, you know, uh, debacle uh, of the last two years, this, this tragedy that, that we, and this awkwardness that we've all lived through. Um, you know, and it, it, the jury is out where we're at with that. Um, so, I didn't miss, I, I, I looked at this work as something as, uh, as timeless as uh, what we all do, right? Whether it be in our studios, whether it be trying to get our lives and adapt to the circumstances um, to emerge uh, spiritually or creative and creatively if not fully to emerge into the world as it looked before, which it may never look again. I really enjoyed the variety of, um, of styles and materials and techniques. Um, and, and I think that what we wound up with, and obviously, as I said in my curatorial statement, you know, it's as much a function of my personal uh, interests visually and conceptually as, as it is anything else. So I didn't, didn't pretend to have some kind of mandate, um, you know, going into it uh, that, that everybody had to handle the theme in a certain way. I was just so impressed by the invention of uh, people's approaches. I thought it was important. I mean, my eye wanted to do this, but I also felt I also felt that it was important to have, you know, a combination of a strong combination of uh, abstract and representational work, a figuration of geometric abstraction, um, of of narrative work, uh, of symbolist work, of work that was. Um, you know, uh, environmentalist or uh, um, socio-political in content, and so I think we did. I think we did that, and I was just just really impressed at where everybody came from um, and how it manifested. I felt that the level of execution on almost everything that was submitted was really impressive. Um, so I really like that we have in 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 our rundown everything from works that engage our sense of whimsy um, to works that are sort of high modernism, postmodernism, uh, seriousness, earnestness, you know, and everything in between. Really, I, I just was very, very impressed and uh, very proud to be associated with, uh, with this exhibition. Um, and uh, congratulations to everybody, uh, you know, who's in the show. And uh, I just think it's really strong. So I'd be happy to talk to anybody if anybody has any questions, either now or later on. Chaz, I don't know what your agenda here is, but uh, uh, I, I was just really impressed. Um, and it was both difficult and yet also when I'm looking at the works, it's like you're just being bombarded by so much food for thought that uh, to me, it's very relaxing. Uh, to look through it, even though you feel the, the sort of feeling of high stakes going on in your head, but yet for me it's very meditative um, <laughs> to zone out, uh, but also to be able to look at the information that people provided. Um, so thank you, Chaz, for letting me be part of it, and uh, I think we've got a very strong lineup. Wonderful. I was just looking through the list of attendees, and um, I know John Siblick was planning to be here, but I don't, unless he's hiding, I don't see him. Um, you know, I think one thing I was very aware of in, in this, uh, because, I, you know, his piece, you know, wound up giving him uh, one of the top honors, and um, 
I felt that it was important to have works that were that were you know, big, big ideas and uh, I don't want to say grandiose because that sounds maybe like overblown, but work that was work that was uh, big and, and, and quote unquote ambitious, uh, but I don't want to call it that because I also wanted to have a lot of very much more smaller intimate works that are ambitious in their own way. Um, so I felt it was, you know, I know we have a lot of works in here that are big in scale and, uh, you know, uh, really going for something that has a, a kind of a multivalent punch to it. But I feel that, that smaller works that are intimate that you can hold in your hand and have a very personal, uh, visceral reaction to are equally valid, equally magnificent in the soul. Um, so I try to make the choices reflect that. Um, Richard, I, I assume I'm sharing the screen now with, uh, with Ripper weaving. Is yeah. that what you're, okay. That's what I can see. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> As, since the other, uh, award winners are not here, why don't I just run through the, the ones you selected and maybe you can give us a few remarks about each one. I felt that uh, on all levels, from formalism to activism, that this show, that this uh, piece was uh, just covered a lot of a lot of bases. I mean, uh, just the you know, and the 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 the, the reflection of the metal with the the water. Um, the fact that the that these it, you know it looks it's, it's an elemental form it, it recedes it comes forth um, but it also collects the debris I don't want to misspeak for the artist and hopefully he'll he will join us um, but you know it collected the debris from the river uh, it was site specific it was temporary and yet there's this delightful um, sort of East Asian uh, uh, feel uh, of it as well, um, which I just I just thought was I, I just thought it, it it did so many things at once uh, that I, I was very impressed. You know, I didn't know when I looked at it at first. Uh, I it, it, I was just seduced by, by the visual of it. Then to learn more about it afterwards um, was kind of icing on the cake. Richard, you broke up there for a minute and what, what most people don't realize and we didn't either until after you had selected this piece. Um, when the river rises, all the, this is, this is the part that broke up when Richard was talking, but uh, when the river rises, all the debris, all the weeds, everything in the river gets hung up in these, in these hoops. So it, it cleans the river and, um, what John was saying about the piece when we spoke to him afterward was that he, he calls this the waft and the weave of the river. And the, uh, the images of this, when it's full of debris, at first is a little unsettling. And then the more you look at it, the more you understand what's going on. And it's, it was such a brilliant, brilliant concept. The filter, you know, it's a, it's a filter, it, it allows breath, you know, it sort of allows the, uh, the river to, uh, to, to, to respirate. Also looks beautiful while it's doing it. Um, it's quite haunting. I think that a lot of people probably wish that it had stayed up uh, in perpetuity and been cleaned off uh, from time to time. It, yeah, you're right. It looked like when I saw, uh, when I saw it filled up with all that stuff, my first thought was, oh, geez, it's, it's got a cancer on it. It's like it's corrupted from how it looked before. And as you said, Chaz, after a while, you're like, well, it's doing what it's doing part of what it was put there to do, not just to enrapture the eye or intrigue the eye, but uh, to do something practical as well. Yeah. <laughs> 
I don't know that I'm very qualified to talk about this. I mean, is the artist here or not? I, I'm here. Uh, it would, I, I thought this was, and I loved looking at the rest of your work. I think this is just so amazing. Uh, the, the way that you, the way that the, the form on top sort of perfectly rests on the form underneath. Could you tell me what the, what these materials are? So it's, it's needle felted wool and then carved marble. So I've been wow. carving marble for a long time. And then um, just over the last three years, I, I started needle felting. Um, someone showed me how, and then I got obsessed. Well, uh, and I saw on your website, uh, other works you've, you're doing and I loved the include, you know, the, the inclusion of the of the, the felting and having textile work, you know, sort of just so perfectly integrated with this hard stone. It just to me it, it just captures so many things so in such an economical but delightful way. I think it's just impossible not to smile when you see this piece. So my hat's off to you. I think uh, this work and uh, the other work that you're doing is really awesome and uh, really captures a lot of dichotomies. Um, what's this piece called again? It's called Just Right. Well, that's a good <laughs> title for that piece. <laughs> Beautiful work, yeah, congrats. You, I really- That's very kind of you, Richard, thank you. Well, I, you're very welcome. Thanks for participating. Stephanie, how many pieces in this in this style have you done? Ooh, um, that's a very good question. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer. I'm going to guess around thirty. Okay, and where would yeah. where would where would this fall? Is this a newer one or an early one? It's a it's a newer one. Yeah, it was um it it was I guess just finished maybe at the tail end of of last of, of last year um but i had been some of them take me a while and this one this one you know it's it's very small but it actually took me a lot longer than some of the the larger ones um sometimes i find that working a small piece you you have to have such economy with form and with texture and 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 color and and all of that that it really um it, it takes me a lot longer actually with the smaller ones than it does the bigger ones. Is that, is that all contiguous um, or is it one, 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 like, or is it all sewn together? It's actually all solid wool. Um, so wool, you know, like from a sheep and then with the needle felting, you use a special needle that has little tiny barbs on it that helps tangle the fibers. And so as you're sort of stabbing um, hundreds of times into this wool, the fibers get more and more tangled and more and more dense. And, um, and they end up being so dense that, um, that actually this is one that I'm working on and, and you, you're, you're not able to squish it anymore. You know, so it starts out as this fuzzy, um, you know, wool texture or fluff essentially. And then as you needle felt it, it gets so hard you can't even squish it. Huh. Wow. And well, and uh, you know, I learned, I've been learning a lot about uh, marble lately. I mean, we had also some pieces that uh, MJ Anderson put in. Yeah. Of course, she's been doing marble carving for such a long time. Right. I've actually uh, learned she, a lot from her. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, she gets her stuff in Carrara. And so wh where do you get your marble from? A lot of places or? A, a lot of places. Um, most recently, um, I, I've i actually, I've, I've been living in the Bay Area in, in the San Francisco kind of Oakland area for um, almost 12 years now. And because I've been living here for, for a while, I get calls from various um, carvers. The stone carving world is quite small. And so I get calls from carvers that have either um, retired or perhaps someone has passed away and I will go and, um, and basically take a crew and, and pick up the stone. Um, and it, a lot of times it's, it's from Italy that they, they've had shipped 
uh, shipped, you know, to the States. Um, so this, this little piece was, I think of recycled. I do a lot of recycling in the way of stone as well. So I use like architectural molding that is destined for landfill, um, as well as sometimes headstones that have been, you know, upgraded and um, wow. those get re recycled as well. Um, so it's this, this one in particular is, is definitely a recycled piece, but I cannot remember exactly where that particular chunk of stone, sometimes it's, um, yeah. it's cast offs. It's, it's things from my large, my carving buddies that would be carving a really big piece and they would lop off a big, you know, a chunk, you know, that they're just going to throw away. And I might go around and scavenge those. And then <laughs> sometimes it's more fun for me to start from something that is someone else's cast off than it is yeah. this very beautiful, pristine block of, of marble. You know, it's sort of like the white paper or the white canvas syndrome where you have this beautiful white thing, um, but it doesn't give you any kind of associations or anything to sort of jump off of. Yeah, yeah good. Well, um, I understand that, uh, you know, but it's, it's the same as uh, artists who have, it's the same as painters, for example, similar. Do they have a process where they don't just start with a, a, a white, canvas or whatever you know that do stuff yeah. to it they until it, it's, it has a history it, it, it's, it and they work off of that it's a call and response in a way and I think that working with materials from diverse sources what you're referring to is an interesting way to kind of be shot riddled with all kind of different stimuli that then you react to in ways that are different and maybe more uh, more le less uh, deductive than if you had just started from the beginning knowing exactly what material you were going for and exactly what you were going to do with it. I do admire the sense of uh, spontaneity and, and um, specificity, you know, I would, and I would, it's not site specificity, it's material specificity. Yeah. No, know? that's exactly right. Yeah. It's, it's so true. And I use, I think in my younger um, artistic days I, I definitely would would put my intent on the material more so than really having a conversation or a relationship with the material and so I think as I mature in my artistic um, career I I'm really enjoying that that not only gaining material knowledge but having this really strong relationship with materials and letting letting those materials have a say in, in what happens with the, the ultimate form yeah Lyndon, did you have a comment? You're muted. And then my face disappeared, so I couldn't unmute. I don't know if it's okay for us to comment here. Um, I want to keep things moving, but we got time for one quick one. Uh, I used to use pristine steel, and when my guys would deliver it to me, I'd actually blow dry it if it had been in the rain. And I've started using steel that has a lot of marks on it. So I understand a little bit what she's saying. Cool. Richard, uh, shall we go to the next one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is, and this is, uh, boy, the, the writing is so small. I can't remind me who this artist is. I mean, I know the piece, but. Guard Jones. And the yeah, title yeah. is Lost. Right. And uh, it's, are we joined by, by him or not? I don't believe so. Guard, are you online? Apparently not. Okay. Yeah, well, so it, it, it's kind of, you know, going, going between these is seeing the diversity of what, of what we've got. You know, I took this work as a very kind of high formalist piece. I like the variety of media. I like the fact that we've got almost a sort of this Jungian archetype in this bound stone, which he does a fair amount. I wish he were on, I could interrogate him about the symbolism. But as it is, it's very, uh, I think uh, very, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, accessible to many different interpretations. None of which really ought to be spelled out in a literal way. Um, so I like the fact that this probably 
laden uh, stone and twine or whatever kind of the rope it is, um, is upon this implacable, intractable black field. Um, you know, we've got this perfect geometry of the circle, which is surrounding this imperfect form, this organic form uh, of the bound stone. And then peeking out from under it, we have what I assume is, uh, I mean, if we, I know that I looked at the media, it's either neon or LED, regardless of what it is. Uh, LED. Yeah, LED, okay. So we've got everything from the most kind of elemental primitive uh, materials to the most uh, au courant. And I just think it's a, this is to me a very enigmatic piece. It, it appeals to our not understanding exactly what it is. Uh, it allows many interpretations. And I absolutely love its dialogue between the ancient and the what we think of as futuristic. Um, to me, this is a, a great enigma. And uh, I don't know whether it's just the really blacker than black aspect of it, but I can't think, uh, I can't help but look at this and think of the famous monolith in Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, <laughs> um, you know, which is also something that at the movie that begins in the in prehistory uh, and then goes out into the deepest. Uh, reaches of the future, uh, you know, and uh, the bone used as a tool. Here we see a rock that, you know, could be used as a tool. Um, I just think that just in general, I think that this piece marries a lot of really diverse unknowns together um, in a way that I think absolutely works. So I take the piece a lot. Anybody else got any one of uh, you know comment on what do they like? Did everybody do, do other people like this piece too, or is it just me? <laughs> Doesn't have to be hypothetical. <laughs> but you want to go into the next one? Okay. Lenticular. This is Jessica Bodner. Yeah. Um, she does a lot. Here. She does a lot of site-specific installation. I learned more about her. I really admire um, the porousness of her work. Um, obviously, we've got a kind of a gateway, which is an important motif, obviously, through the visual arts. Um, gateway from what to what? Well, I guess that's up to us to decide. She does a lot of, you know, large scale site specific installations. Um, this again is what I was talking about is everything from big work uh, in a with the landscape behind it to little pieces, you know, that we can just have a per more personal up, up close relationship with. But this, you know, obviously invites us to step through a corridor from one metaphorical state to another. While, al while allowing all of the elements of earth, wind, and fire, and et cetera, to be semi-permeable through this kind of elusive forest-like uh, structure. Um, I, I really think it's a really nice piece, and she does beautiful work in a lot of different contexts. She does public art, um, I think private commissions. Uh, is, is she with us, by the way, or not? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just, I really like it. And, you know, I think, you know, I had to come, you know, this, I, this piece, I, I don't immediately have it at hand where it is, but it puts, you know, and it's not, it's not, it wasn't during the Burning Man. I looked up into that, but the reason I thought about it, obviously, we're on some kind of playa, or some kind of uh, you know uh, mesa or plain of some. Uh, and we see a lot of work like this at, at at a place like Burning Man, which I've been to twice, by the way. And I think a lot of people uh, 
associate, you know, site-specific landscape referencing uh, work such as this. I think we've gotten more used to seeing that in the advent, in the aftermath of what Burning Man has done. Uh, my relationship with Burning Man was pretty complicated in terms of looking at it as an art. I, I, I think that uh, when we see work such as this, that I think that the experience of the last 20, 25 years, whatever it's been a Burning Man, uh, has gotten us more used to seeing <laughs> landscape-based site-specific uh, installation. On to the next one. It's Jennifer Thyssen, Thyssen, isn't it? Uh, did I get the first name right? Karen. 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 Oh, Karen. Karen is here. Yeah, yeah. Tyson. It's pronounced Tyson. But... Tyson. Okay, very good. Yeah. Hi, it's nice to see you. Hi. I was very much impressed by all of your work when I looked it up. Uh, I think that what you selected for the for the show. Um, I, I, I just, uh, you know, obviously I juried this by images, but this was really, this really made me want to see it in real life. Um, I, I really, really enjoy uh, what you do with kind of illusionism with certain properties of op art. Um, I, but I love that these, you know, I love the materials. Uh, these, this is rocks and stones, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, so, so where do you get them from and do you are they painted do you paint them with spray paint or how do you what's the deal yeah I, so i find them um i found these in california um on i love nature i love to go out on on hikes and things and so i collect a lot of rocks <laughs> i have a very large rock collection um and so yeah these were uh i live in new mexico now but i collected these in california Mm -hmm. um in the bay area and yeah i painted those just actually with acrylic paint um mm -hmm. and wanted to so i work as a digital product designer um in the tech industry um so i'm you know very sort of steeped in the digital world and aesthetic but i also really um but i love nature and so yeah. it's really a combination of those two things is the way I think about it. Yeah. I can see that because, you know, a lot of times you'll make these, uh, I don't know if grid is the right word, but they've mm -hmm. got this kind of topography to them that almost makes me think of like a movie like Tron, you know, yeah. back in the early 80s with these sort of uh, illusionism going on with sort of the warping of the space time uh, matrix or whatever. Yep. Um, so to, to see to see what you're doing with that, it makes sense that you mentioned that you've got one foot into the high tech and one foot in just the organicism of nature. Um, and the way the, 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 the many iterations of that that you come up with are quite impressive to me. Well, thanks. Um, you know, I'm gonna be in Santa Fe the entire month of October. Um, oh, I don't know if you're in Santa Fe or a different part, but I'm, um, I'm in Santa Fe. Yeah. yeah well, I, we should we should hang out, and I uh, should would, love to come see your studio. That would be awesome. That would be yeah. great. I will be there the entire month of October. So let's let's get together. Awesome. That sounds great. Cool. Yeah, I really enjoyed your piece a lot, and I I loved its yeah. intimacy, but also its. Uh, and its accessibility, but also, again, as with the other piece I mentioned of guard, you know, there's a certain inscrutability to it too. You are really taking kind of a formalist conceit, but recontextualizing it in a way that I found very evocative. Uh, and I, th I think that, that, that the use of the, the natural stones and what you do with them, um, turns them into a just a sort of high formalist piece that gives people myriad avenues of interpretation and enjoyment. So mm. uh, really, really like what you're doing a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Who's in charge now? Alexander Haig or Chaz? <laughs> or, I'm, uh, I'm back, at least okay. temporarily. <laughs> <laughs> The reference um, that maybe about three people will get. 
I'd like to uh, maybe just take the, the next few minutes and open it up to anyone else who has any uh, comments, observations, or questions about any, uh, any piece in the show. I'd like to ask about the last piece. Um, I can't remember your name. Um, the the, uh, the metal you used with the rocks to hold them in place. What was that? Um, that's just wire. It's just uh, steel wire, like at the hardware store. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, just trying to make it kind of almost disappear and you know, sort of playing with optics. Um, things that are shiny tend to not, you know, be as noticeable. So it's just, I've done a lot of experimentation with different types of materials and wires, you know, and things like that. And that it, it kind of helps add to that effect of the feeling of the, of the rocks kind of floating in this like matrix. Is it is that, anyway, that's kind of the, you know, the concept of it. Thank you. And then use some adhesive, some kind of adhesive to apply the rocks to the steel. Is that the way you do that? Yeah, yeah. So use um, hot melt glue and epoxy. Karen, have you you've done a number of pieces in this in this series, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where does this fall? Is it an early piece, later piece? It's a it's a very recent piece. Um, it's it's, I guess it's my most recent piece. Um, I actually did that piece in Santa Fe because I moved here in May. And so that's the first piece I made um, while, since being here. Um, yeah, I brought, I made sure I had, I brought all my rocks with me so I could like start making it. It's, <laughs> even before all my stuff got moved here, I was like, I gotta have my uh, art materials with me, so. <laughs> So in the in the progression from the the earliest pieces to this most recent piece, um, how were they different? Were the first ones more rigid, more fluid, more? This, I mean, how 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 has it evolved? Um, yeah, I was doing a lot of like sculptures, like freestanding sculptures um, for for a while, kind of like more like orbs, I guess, and then. Um, I think people really respond to the the wall pieces, um, so I kind of started to gravitate towards those. Um, and then, you know, also I can make those a lot bigger, so I'm trying to go bigger. Um, I submitted another piece that was, you know, quite a bit bigger. So, you, you know, you can actually imagine like building those in like sections and you can make them quite large, you know, on a, on a big wall. So that's, you know, something that I think it has a lot of potential to just with the scale aspect of it. Do you have to install all these pieces yourself? Like if somebody buys a piece, is it possible for them to put it up or do you mm -hmm. have to go there and do it or? Yeah, I mean, I think it it would be, yeah, I mean, I'm, um, you know, some of them, like, if they're have different, like, are made of multiple parts, that would be a little bit harder, but that one that got into the show is just one piece, and you literally can just, like, hang it on the wall and then, yeah. you know, tack it in certain places. <laughs> yeah, cool. By the way, we, uh, uh, we, Wound up, as correct me if I'm wrong on this, but we wound up deciding, making a decision that we one work uh, that they had some piece um, rather than at first I included multiple pieces by the same artist and then we just ballooned so big that we were like, okay, well, for it, each artist just have one piece. Um, mm -hmm. So that was more of a, a practical uh, decision than a real, you know curatorial decision in a way. Um, but uh, yeah, well, that's so cool. Um, I'm just really intrigued. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Now, are other, uh, Chaz, are other artists on here that um, uh, 
that that have work in the show even uh, you know i know we've showed the work that we you know gave the awards to and all that but are there other artists here who did other works that are in the show but you know didn't get the top whatever or not yes yeah, it's probably all well, of I, us. I think all. Oh, of us. okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I'd love to. I'd love to. Chaz. I don't know if this is possible, but gosh, it'd be fun to. I don't know how much time we've got, but we could if we brought up pictures of works uh, that are also in the show, but then the artists are here, and we could talk to them a little bit. Or is that beyond the scope of what we're up to right now? You're, you're Chaz. muted, Chaz. You're muted. You are my only hope. Obi Wan. <laughs> I, for oh, some reason, see, now we can see all your stuff on your computer. I see. You better make sure there's nothing bad. On there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now, do you know what I'm saying? Like, is is that, or did you just want to talk about the ones that the other top five or whatever? Um, I don't know what time constraints are here too, or what? If we can, if we can keep them brief. And if I can get over my technical issues here. Um, that would I've, be never fun. Had, I've, I've never had this much trouble with, um, with Zoom before. Or my I've never, I've never moderated one. I, I think that would probably be beyond my capability as a technical person, but. Uh... Rick, just, uh, I mean, Richard, just pick someone. Well, I mean, is everybody, is everybody I'm seeing on this little screen, like have people who have work in the show? Show okay. of hands. Well, so Rebecca Edwards is the one I see right next to my face right now. Um, and and I'm, I do apologize that I, I can't just recall it out of my brain, which piece is associated with which name. Um, you only have you, 500 to look at, right? <laughs> uh, there's there's a, there's only 60 actually in the in the show yeah no but there but there were fi over 500 there were that's for sure yes. were. yeah so um yeah so it's, can we get rebecca's uh piece up there i don't want to commandeer this thing it's into a, i don't i don't know if there's a quicker way to get through this than to um uh -huh. let's see. Is it in alphabetical um, order? Because my last name starts with an E. I don't know if that is. Yeah. It's a giant nest with a bra underneath it. That helps. Oh, it just went past it. There it is. OK. Oh, well, that, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Wow. I'd love to have you tell me a little bit about this. Um, well, the bra is bronze and it is gigantic and it is from a real bra that I found at the estate sale. And it's placed so that the pedestal is tall enough that the bra is about at eye level, so, or maybe just a little bit higher. So she towers over you. And then the nest is made with all kinds of things uh, I do find a lot of bird's nests and a lot of things that I see in bird's nests I put in there like pieces of ribbon and stuff and then I filled it full of the combs um, thinking about um, like you can never have breasts that are too big you can never have too long a hair you know all these things that that you see on rock videos and things like that and so but the the mate the reality of those things is is crazy and and uh, hair becomes such a big tangled mess I think of all these people that have weaves and just when I was a girl, I had long hair and my mom would have to struggle getting a comb through a little girl's long hair and just all those difficulties and how it's, it's kind of hilarious in a way. So I'm hoping that there's always humor that comes through. And so, so this is, so this is really dealing with some of the pressures that girls and women feel uh, both the, you know, specifically about hair as a as a as a signifier of of whatever feminine charms we're socially sociopolitically sort of uh, <coughs> supposed supposed to uh you know 
And the same thing about breasts, is that right? So there's a sort of a feminist commentary going on here. Definitely, but I think it, it I mean, I, I deal of course a lot with a lot of women's issues being women, but a lot of them, of the things that I talk about too, I think, you know, it, it, there's that kind of pressure um, on everybody for different reasons. And then I thought it related to emergence because she is so big and so above that she does have this sense of power. She is powerful, even though um, you know, trying to rely on these things, but the things that that people associate superficially, I mean, superficially, mm -hmm. not everybody agrees with that, but, but you know, the long hair is a wreck and the, the big breasts are this, you know, old rumpled gigantic structure that has to hold those big breasts up, so. Yeah. Is that so now it did you cast that bra from yes. the real bra or did you take the bra and then bronze it like is there is no there I, real I, I made a mold and I cast it. okay okay so yeah yeah powerful piece I'm really glad you told me told us more about you know what's going on it with it you know and the fact that you, that it can simultaneously be a critique of those tropes but yet a celebration of the, you know, the power of, of this figure. I mean, it, it's it's an abstracted figure in a way. Um, I, I like how it sort of plays both sides of the equation. You know, there's a self-awareness to it. Beautiful work. Thank you. Yeah. I'll scroll down and if uh, if your piece comes up, say so. It met me. It met me. Okay, Carol. Yeah. Which one? Oh, so Carol. Okay. Can we bring yeah. that up? I'm back up. I think everybody's back yeah. up. Yeah. The carpet. The bug. Oh yeah. Bug. Yeah. Right. Okay. Back cool. Cool. Yeah, I would. I'd love to hear a little bit about this. How you do it? I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you tonight? I work in large scale. A lot of my work is mass, not very silent. Um, a lot of my work is tall columns. I can maybe tell you. Um, the fear. Here, yeah. all the different grades mm -hmm. is about, well, I was making eggs, I was making acorns, and I moved to just more abstract, a little more universal, a little more, just put it out there as a whether it's something micro or long, like the planet, the universe. So my husband likes to think of it sort of like a planet or a moon or earth. And so how is it related to emergence and the COVID virus? Well, maybe a little bitty cellular level, but huge impact maybe just that mass, that containment, to fit the physical nature of clay. I like the muscling of my clay, the coiling of this rolling out this slab. And my work has gotten more colorful. So, am I just, well, I put it out there because it seemed complete. Are you mm -hmm. hearing me so far? Yes. It's I mean, like an egg. I mean, it's like an egg that there's maybe something that's going to emerge from. Like, like a, some new thing is going to emerge. Um, oh, well, thank you. Yeah, you have to type whatever you're saying so I can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, um, and, and I'm not, uh, here we go. Let's back up. I'm yeah. living in the state, Louis, Missouri. So it's nice that we are going, hello, a face to face. So it's kind mm -hmm. of that you can't test the one or lip breathe or give you a hug. So mm -hmm. it's kind of surreal with having a show that's virtual. So it's nice. Yeah, yeah. 
include, invite to thank you. I think you all are doing a good job. Thank you. Now, what's inside of this? Is it just multiple layers of, of ceramic? Yeah. Yeah, I like it coming up. Yeah, no life. What to come? It's mm -hmm. hope. Yeah. Oh, material. All right. Um, I have actually two studio and working in St. Louis studio. Well, let's back up to Chip Clay. It's somewhere. It's hollow. It's about about yeah, about that thick. And I, I make it taller, it gets thinner. But it's still a very thick wall with the clay, the bottom mm. mm. So it's about a thick wall up on it. <clears throat> and it weighs over wall 250 pounds. Let me write that down. 250 pounds. You're right, you're right, you got it. And I make, I mix my own glaze. It's not like you buy a lot of a jar and put it in. It's my own recipe. The clay itself is my own recipe. So when you think of it as white bread or zucchini bread or corn bread or <laughs> um, whole wheat, my clay is very rugged, it's very dry. You want more of a, a roll when you want to eat off of your plate. You want porcelain and dinnerware. But if you're outside in the in the elements, you want a more rugged, sturdy clay. So the question of the corn bed makes the clay more open. And that way, it's a good outdoor material. It's fused. A fire in the gas kiln, 2,200 degrees. How many firings, Carol? How many times did you fire this piece? Yeah, that's correct. We call it cone seven in, in terms of Clay people talking to each other. The moment time with cone seven, two thousand two hundred Fahrenheit, and it takes about a month, one week to well, one one time final, one one week to build a piece, to build it up. It, it starts here and then it gets firm. Why not? It starts down. I uh, it starts. I down and then I to get firmer, then I turn it up and start adding clay wall to it. But I have to I let it dry hard to get thick, and then I can turn my clay to build on it. So it takes about one week to build a piece, it takes about 10 hours, but I have to space it out to get the thickness. You can't just flap, you have to get thick yeah. and more in. I really I love the color to dry. I love get it. all the air out, so it's completely dry. I have wet hair. I want to dry. Then it takes four days, so it's like a week, to put it in the counter and buy a real low 200 degrees, 200 degrees, Monday, Tuesday, and then on Wednesday, it's firing day. And on Wednesday, it climbs to 2,000. And then I cool down and I open it on Thursday. <gasps> Sometimes I have to do a little repair, like a little crack and a little silicone. So it's a month, a week to create, dry, and buy it. I think it's one of the, the uh, one thing I like in this show is there are elemental forms. And I don't think you could, it would be hard to find a more elemental form than this oval, oval or circle. And you know, I think it goes very perfectly with the idea of emergence. Um, when we see a form like this, we want to know well, what's inside of it. What does it have to tell us? What's going to come out of it? You know, um, is it evil? Is it good? Is it amoral? What is it? Um, I think you pose a very powerful question with this piece. And uh, I think that the integration between the material struggles that you make it's not just collapse like a souffle uh, uh, 
combined with the symbolism of it, make this a very rich addition to this uh, big exhibition. Right, good at evil. The, 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 the core, kind of like a core. Right mm. in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And very haunting piece. I love it. Does anyone else have um, have a piece that uh, Scott or Rick? Yeah, if you'll go back to the uh, overall, scroll up slowly. Oh, whoa, whoa, you just passed it. The metamorphosis piece right there. Ooh, yeah. Wow. So that's your piece. Yeah, first off, I'm, I'm elated that you selected it. Well, I'm elated that you submitted it because it's super cool. And I've, <laughs> I'm glad you're on there. I'm dying to know more about like what you know, I, I, I look at this in a way I see vertebral. I, I see a kind of vertebral forms, you know, obviously going up this sort of unseen spine. Um, but I'm, I'm, I wonder if you could tell me more about the materials and what's going on. Um, I think that just yeah. even the base and the way everything rises from it, I assume it's connected in the back. Uh, yeah, it's, it's got a, uh, yeah, it's got a uh, steel screw through from the from the base uh, straight up into uh -oh. the piece itself. That makes sense. Uh, the, yeah, tell me some about this and what what you're going for too, because I was just so intrigued. I mean, I'm just I love the regularity of the ascent of this verticality, and yet I'm also really into just this sort of oozy organic. Uh, you know, Jabba the Hutt, like uh, sort of uh, <laughs> arms that are just yeah. kind of oozing everywhere. I really dig it. Well, where it all started uh, in 2011, I was at the New Zealand Artist Collaboration. And I was told before I went that if I go, it'll change my art. And it did. So it's a combination of the Maori sculptures that I saw on the island, uh, the uh, Pacific Islander grimace, which is a form of greeting and also intimidation. And it's also- I missed the, are you, I'm, I, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I missed the uh, important question of where you were when you saw this is- Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I was in New Zealand. Okay. In Whangarei, New Zealand. I was uh -huh. there for an international artist collaboration. It's called Collaborations. Uh, if you can read it on my shirt, you're looking at it. And oh, were you in were you in Auckland? Uh, no, we were in Whangarei, uh, which is to the northeast of Auckland. It's up along the coast. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, I was in New Zealand in 2015 and uh, spent five weeks there. there. Well, yeah. Well, maybe uh, I saw you along. Okay, so you small world. So going back to the inspirations, but yeah, yeah. It, it was inspired by the by the Maury grimace. It was also inspired because uh, my work had changed because of what I was exposed to at the collaboration. And also I've got a background in geology. I was studying to be a geologist when the bottom fell out of the oil market in 74. And my uh, uh, then professor said, you know, there are PhD geologists right now that are sweeping the floor. You might want to consider a different path, which is what I did. Um, but metamorphosis in geology refers to the changing of the structure of the rock masses due to heat and pressure. So when you drive by a road cut, you see all these waves, that's, that's for metamorphosis. And there you have it. The material is, uh, it's an engineered structural beam called Paralam made by Weyerhaeuser. And it's uh, a series of veneer thin strips that are all compressed together under tons of pressure with a really strong epoxy. And which is really tough on tools. That's all hand carved uh, mm -hmm. with chisels, yeah. Um, and sanded, it looks very smooth. Uh, it is not sanded very smooth at all. It looks huh. smooth, but yeah. it, when you go to touch it, it definitely has texture. Not sharp texture, but it's not texture. I am all about texture. The, mm -hmm. the outside 
uh, where the black is, that is smooth, relatively. Um, and then the base okay. is, is um, western red cedar with, oh. the, with a ferrous oxide patina on it. And I, I just thought it just worked so well together. Me too, uh, you know, I kind of assumed, I mean, I know that I did look at what the actual media was, but I, it looks like burl. It looks like a burl in the image, you know? And uh, so I wondered, you know, the degree to which it was all, I mean, obviously it's very shaped, you know, it, it all fits together like, like butter, you know? I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so you're talking about the Mary Grimace. This you're talking about when they stick their tongue out, right? In the yeah, in yeah, the yeah. It's just a, yeah, and you see it all around the Pacific Islands. It's not just the Maori, right? Uh, um, yeah, anywhere in the Pacific Islands, you'll see it in their sculptures. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at the Easter Island sculptures, you'll see it there. Uh huh. Yeah. And, and wow. Well, I'm just you know, how did you come by this material? I mean. How did you know it was going to be do what you wanted I, it to do? I did not know it was going to do as it turned out that way. It was a my brother had to have the header of his garage door replaced, and they brought out this <laughs> thirty-five foot long beam uh, paralam, and they cut off five feet. And he called me and says, "Hey, I got a scrap of wood for you because you, you, you do what what I do." And I said, "Okay, uh, I'll come get it." It was so heavy, I had to end over end it in the back of my pickup. And so I cut off a section with, with my chainsaw and then just started having at it with, with uh, the bandsaw to uh, give me the rough curves. And then everything else is done with an angle grinder to refine those curves and then just chisel. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I love the randomness that, <laughs> that you came upon this, this material. You know, well, it's, it's a sense of movement. Uh, yeah, like I say, if you look at the metamorphic rocks, there's there's definitely a sense of movement to it. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, when I saw this work, I definitely thought magma, molten. Yep. You know, um, you know, there's I don't know if you know there's a as a Portland-based uh, sculptor artist that I know named Brenda Mallory. She just had a show last month at uh, Russo Lee Gallery. Um, she, I profiled her for Surface Design Journal about maybe, probably like nine years ago or something. And it's so funny, uh, she, you know, she got her start with the material she used for a long time because she ran a Portland-based business that was about um, mm, menstrual, uh, I don't know what the proper word to call it. We think panty liners, whatever, you know, I don't know what the right term is, but ones that were organic and reusable and nature friendly and all that. Well, this was cloth, right? So she had this extra cloth lying around her basement studio because this was the business. And she was like, well, what could I do with these parts that we're not using, right? It's all this cloth. And, the, and so, wow, what if I did that with it? And uh, so that was kind of random too, in terms of how she got to that material and the stuff that she made out of it is just extraordinary. Um, so I, I, I really dig it when people find things to do to repurpose and, uh, you know, materials you wouldn't normally think about. I mean, that, you wouldn't normally, you, you know, but she made it into this glorious art. So the okay. fact that your... Uh, yeah. Just the material drives the uh, drives the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I, that's that's a more inductive approach for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so Richard, I, Richard, we have uh, we've got a few more people I want to include here before yeah. we need to yeah. sign off. Thank so you, thank you, Richard. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. That was fascinating. Lyndon, do you want to? Yeah, my piece is next door to that. Uh, oh, I yeah. yeah, I don't like to talk about my work. It's open to interpretation, <laughs> but um, I'll take questions. You don't like to talk about it. Well, I think it's open to interpretation. Uh -huh. um, it's all steel. I do um, it's sort of monochromatic is my thing. And I was saying before that I used to use brand new steel, um, but I've now sort of changed to some used steel. Um, and that's an eight-inch plate. 
Um, and one of the things I really like to do now is hold the piece so that some of the edges are open. Um, and the, um, the little, I call them windows, are also um, steel. They're eighth inch square rod that I welded with the torch. Really? Is this, is this bronze or what is the, the bigger oh, structure? Oh no, it's, it's steel. Steel, okay. Is it core 10 mm -hmm. steel? No, I no, I actually. Oh my gosh, um, it was uh, going. I was going to a solo show and I sat on the floor, honestly crying, as I heated it up and poured patina over it, over yeah. and over again, trying to get something that I liked. So I kept heating it with the torch, um, rubbing it off uh, until I got something that I liked. Because I fold it, it's actually. I use an angle grinder to angle grind the outside. Of, I don't score it on the inside. I score it on the outside with an angle grinder so it turns into bright, bright. Uh, so then I patina it to get that color down. But I didn't do anything to the um, to the little windows. I had a studio assistant that one semester and she dremeled every one of them with a wire brush. <laughs> is, uh, is, is there welding involved in this? Well, I had to weld when I made uh, the two pieces that make up the box. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. There are two separate pieces. They're welded up the back. I thought so. And, and the windows are actually welded with the torch. Mm -hmm. You call them windows, and it looks like a window, but it also looks like the window logo of the uh, Apple computer, I believe. Oh, well, Alex, you're hurting me. Mac and, Mac and Pod. <laughs> <laughs> ow, ow. <laughs> Fortunately, no one's ever, you're not allowed to say what it means to you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's no funny. one's ever said that to me. Mm -hmm. I have been working on piles of things. Um, and oh, I, I don't know if you've been to my site, but um, you always think you need 100 until you put them down on the ground. You go, oh, no, maybe 200. Oh, 1,000. This will be awesome. <laughs> well, something is, 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 is it, there's the windows coming out of, of an aperture. There's windows coming out of a a chasm, right? There's or are they energy. going back in? Oh, that's a good. Well, that <laughs> that ties very much into the theme of emergence or re, re disappearance, doesn't it? <laughs> it's also it's actually called inhibit the inhibitors, and um, I uh, these names just kind of occur to me. I, they're not intended necessarily to be clues, but um, my brother in law was working on cancer research and. There was he was he was coming up with a drug to inhibit the inhibitors that are causing the cancer. So mm -hmm. the inhibitors are are inhibiting something that and then they cause the cancer. And I was just really struck by that sort of circular thinking. Mm -hmm. I adore it. I think it's so mysterious and arcane and elusive. Your question of whether it's whether they're going back in or coming out, I think is we could think about that in probably 50% would say one way, 50% would say another way. Uh, <laughs> but just this sort of aspect of a ravine that's that's tall and kind of cathedral-like. I mean, what you've established here is almost like a entryway to some kind of Richard Serra designed cathedral. You know, oh, thank you. And all of us are filing into it or filing out of it, going like, what the hell just happened? Or what's going to happen? <laughs> um, to me, I look at it and that's what I think. Uh, uh, I, I just think it's beautiful work, formally and, and, and symbolically gorgeous. Thank you. I did not go to art school, I came from an advertising background. A lot of people who make very, very, very fine. Uh, work do. I think advertising has produced some of the most uh, amazing artists and some of the best work of the of the latter half of the 20th century. I mean, Richard Avedon, I think, is non pareil as a as a as a portrait artist. Obviously, did a hell of a lot of great commercial work in fashion photography. Um, I think what we see in advertising in, uh, in particular is uh, extraordinary. And, and not to say anything about Andy Warhol, you know, I mean, so the, the, uh, the, 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 
the the links, the in, in interstitial nature between these disciplines, I think is very uh, uh, symbiotic. So anyway, well, that's gorgeous. I'm glad you told us about that. Thanks for including it. I feel like it's quite a bit different from a lot of the pieces in the show. I adore it. So uh, Richard, Scott is uh, Scott is next in line here, I think. Yep. Scott oh, is with us. Good. Oh, neat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love Scott, to you need to unmute. Got it. You know, a, uh, compared to all these other things that are so cutting edge, uh, this is actually a piece that I did last year that's called Emergence. Uh, and it really all started with the centerpiece, which is av avocado wood. And um, uh, I'm like most people, once they know you, you in the wood, they start giving you wood. You know? <laughs> and uh, there's an avocado orchard that's uh, close to me that uh, a friend of mine that's a sculptor said, why don't you come and look through the orchard and see if you can find some wood. And so the centerpiece was a a piece of a trunk of a tree that, that had died uh, was pretty dried out and uh, avocado wood uh, just finishes up really nice. So this was the end of a log that I had and I had only finished the top part of it because it looked like a bird. So uh, it was sitting uh, in my studio for a number of years, finished only the top part and I also have some pieces of birch that I had made into uh, sail shapes, uh, living in Carlsbad by the ocean. I do a lot of things that have sail shapes. And then one day I looked at it and I said, that's a bird. I cut that off. I took this, uh, the birch piece, cut them in half. And to me, it looked like a bird that was emerging from a lake. So that, that was my uh, inspiration for this piece. And then other people have looked at this piece and said, gee, it looks like a bird of paradise, mm -hmm. uh, which is always nice when you have two different uh, interpretations of, of a shape that, that you form. And uh, so that's, that's pretty much this piece. Well, I see, now that you mentioned it, I see the bird of paradise. And uh, it's funny, I didn't look at it and necessarily see a bird, but I did see maybe like a bird in space, you know? I saw something abstract that was indicating uplift and ascension and maybe escape into something better. Um, so I'm so ignorant about horticulture. So avocados <laughs> grow on trees, yeah? Yes, they do. Uh, Okay, so this is the, the wood of a tree that bears avocados, okay. Correct, correct. And um, uh, Now, I'm, I'm also ignorant of uh, California geography, <laughs> um, but I have a friend who's, whose mother has an avocado farm that's in uh, near Santa Barbara. Now, is that where Carlsbad is? Carlsbad is uh, northern, north, just north of San Diego. So Santa Barbara is, is oh, north so of Los Angeles. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's yeah. further north. But avocados right. grow all over. Um, they love the, the uh, coast. So you see a lot of them close to the coast, like Santa Barbara, San Diego. Yeah. Um, and uh, they take a lot of water. So you have to have a lot of water for uh, an avocado orchard. And when it went through the drought, a lot of the uh, orchards did die away. Um, and part of this yeah. orchard did. So yeah. I, love, I love the wood. It has a distinct uh, fragrance when you're working on it, when you're cutting it or sanding it. And it, it has this wonderful golden um, uh, thing to it. That it's just, it's just a, I love the look of it. So. Uh, well, is yeah. is this typical? I mean, is is it? Do, do you have, is this typical of your work in terms of sort of like semi abstracting an idea um, using work that you sort of had around for a while and been looking at, being like, well, what could this become? And you put different elements together, and it references the natural world, although not directly, you know, replicating it. Yes. I, yes to that question. I, I have, uh, I do different types of work. One is this type where I'll take a piece of uh, 
raw wood and form it into something um, abstract. Um, and then the other thing that I do comes from a design of uh, a wood that actually has been milled. Um, and uh, I use a lot of uh, different hardwoods, uh, mahogany and uh, hmm. Well, they are typical woods, but I'll design a shape out of that. Uh, and then I'll also take a piece of uh, raw wood that's been, you know, milled locally. Uh, so I'll take the top piece that has a lot of bark and stuff on it uh, and deal with that. So, yeah. I, I think what you've captured is just, just pure out fundamental, elemental. Uh, it's gorgeous. It speaks to moving out of uh moving out uh, i mean it, it, m moving above <laughs> yeah i think we um, bored carol there but well i think we may have <laughs> thank um, you i wanted to thank you so much richard for picking this piece um and uh you know it's, it's really a great show i'm so happy to be here well i'm yeah you're welcome and thank you for submitting and i think it's Absolutely, just powerful. Just think it's powerful. What you've done with three elements here, four including the base, uh, is, uh, you know, and 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 that that contour, where the the burl or whatever you call the concentrated color there, almost looks like an eye. I mean, so everything kind of comes together in this is sort of semi-abstract depiction of a of an ascendant uh, creature. Um, you know, I have learned more about uh, wood and, and, and wood sculpture, both utilitarian and non-utilitarian. I wrote a book recently about uh, abstract expressionist Sam Francis, and he was friends with J.B. Blunk up there in Point Reyes, uh, California. Um, and so uh, Sam bought many of J.B.'s works um, and uh, JB actually found a stone that uh, Sam's son Shingo incorporated into his grave gravestone. So, but anyway, during the whole process, I learned a lot more about uh, you know wood wood sculpture and uh, using found found wood to create uh, beautiful forms that speak to us in different ways. So, uh, I think maybe some of that. Uh, was in my head when I was looking with this beautiful, gorgeous piece of yours. Uh, I, I think the one thing I think all the artists that are on this call would agree on is once you get into a particular medium, whether it's wood, stone, or metal, um, you, you really gravitate. You, you just love the medium that you work in. Uh, mm -hmm. Karen, I think we're talking about uh, the stone and the wire. I mean, she loves to work with that. That's, that's become her medium. And I'm the wood guy, so that's that's actually a nice segue to the next piece, which is uh, Chris, uh, Alex, Chris Alexander. Yes. Uh, and is Chris Alexander with us also? He is. I am. I, I'm here. Yeah, I really enjoy. Oh, hi. Hi. I really um, speaking. By the way, to real quick, uh, one other tangent about you know, materials that we gravitate toward. I always feel that it's the biggest challenge for any artist is can it, it, is what you make with the raw material better, whatever that means, than the raw material was to begin with. So if you look at, a, at, at, at bags of raw pigment in, a, in India, in a bazaar, you know, separated by the color, can you put them together in a way that's better than just looking at them in a pure state, quote unquote? Like if you look at a gorgeous piece of wood, can you do anything better or more somehow meaningful than what that thing was on its own? And so uh, I think the whole realm of art is <laughs> artists rising to the challenge and saying, well, yes, I believe I can do the, to the challenge. Um, and some people fail and some people succeed and a lot of people are in the middle. But uh, I think that when you've got beautiful materials to begin with, evocative materials, what do you do with that? You know? 
So I love this piece. Is and this is a kiln form piece, isn't it, Chris? Uh, yes. Yeah. So it's it's all done in the kiln, and um, I'm kind of fairly recently transitioning into more um, 3D work. I started out 30 years ago as a stained glass artist, and I still do a lot of a lot of stained glass um, residential and and um, ecclesiastical commissions. Um, but I got really fascinated with trying to do work that um, helped people see glass and not just blown glass as more of a fine art than a craft. And um, also just kind of pushing, you know, so that we don't just kind of see glass in this square, you know, window that is very traditional, traditionally accepted. And um, so I'm, I'm doing some work now that combines metal and glass as well, but one of my just all out kind of in love with the material favorite things to do is to make a drop vessel and that's, that's what this is. And you fuse the glass together as a thick um, flat blank first and then put it back in the kiln over a shelf that has a hole in it of some shape or another and heat it slowly and um, the shape under the power and influence of heat and gravity emerges, you know, so that's why I thought this was kind of um, appropriate. Um, and I just think it's the, the, it creates these kind of luscious forms as the glass falls through and distorts the pattern. And um, it's just really, I don't know, gets me going. <laughs> well, got me going too. And I love the contrast between these sort of pebbly, nubby textures and the more smooth. I love these distortions that you're talking about. Um, you know, I've been very lucky being in the Portland area to have had a, a long kind of uh, incubation with uh, bullseye glass. Sure. And sure. the folks that uh, run it, who uh, I'm very fond of. Um, and I've juried a couple shows for them and You've gotten familiar with, uh, you know, some of the people in New Zealand, like Claudia Barella and uh, 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 Catherine Whiteman, and then uh, Australian people like Giles Bettison, and also people in our neck of the woods, uh, like Richard Marquis up on Whidbey Island. And uh, I just uh, have gotten such an appreciation of kiln-formed work that I didn't really know much about before. And I've just been seduced into the, into the world of what can one do with a vessel, for example, as you've uh, presented us here. Um, I think there's an infinitude of expressions that can arise from this process, processes. Um, and I really just thought you knocked it out of the ballpark. And I very much enjoyed your stained glass work as well. I went to your website and I just was touched. I do have a piece of somebody touching the heart of Christ, I believe. Am I remembering correctly? Yes, yeah. Um, that yeah. was actually a representation of the story of St. Thomas. Okay. When, Saint, he, is, when he reaches the wound in, in Christ's sign. Yeah. I don't think anybody necessarily has to be Christian in order to really feel something big looking at that piece. Um, so between your work in stained glass and the other forms, I just think you're doing beautiful work. And uh, I really thought this was a perfect piece to include um, in the realm of work that's in glass. So uh, keep up the good work in this the stained glass work is just, I really like what you're doing with that too. Thank you. And thank you for including me in the show. It was really an honor. Well, it's, the show is richer for you to be in it, being in it. So this one is um, Jen Muse. Yeah. Hi. Hello, Jen. Wow. Thank you for contributing this. I really dig this. Tell, can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure, sure. So um, a little bit along the lines of some of the things the other artists were saying, I, I love wood. 
and I'm a glass artist. And I actually picked up this uh, piece of wood about 15 years ago. And it's been, it sat in my studio for a really long time <laughs> until I figured out what I, what I could do with it. And uh, the, the glass is actually, sorry, a process um, kiln, it's a kiln form piece from tempered glass. And it's a recycled uh, piece of shelving that I smashed. And then I played around for a couple of years with uh, playing with the tempered glass in the kiln. And then I kind of started to merge these two materials together. And this is one of the very first pieces I did. I've done about eight in the series so far. Well, it's gorgeous. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's it's so tempting to look at things and see other things like uh, a tuning fork or a hand mirror or something that would be practical. Um, are you al alluding to anything in particular here or is this for you in a purely abstract work? Well, it's an abstract work, but the idea of merging these two materials together in, in this series is to, um, so the, I should say a little bit more about the casting process. The glass is actually made from a form that I create. Each piece is made specifically for that piece of wood. So based on what I see in the wood and the growth rings, I create a casted mold out of a fiber or metal. And then I cast that piece of glass to reflect what I see in the wood. So it's kind of, uh, it emerges, you know, the, the glass responds to the growth patterns in the wood. And that's the kind of feed back and forth to create the final piece. And my background is in architecture. So that always kind of plays a part in the final product. I bet. I've talked to so many architects lately, including last night, a dinner that we had at some friend's place. And, and then this uh, woman named Sally Squire, who has a show of work at Murda Collections here in Portland. Uh, you know, she has an architecture background and uh, I know a lot of Ali has, you know, he runs painting practice like an architecture studio. The <coughs> commonality between ones, I think it's really symbiotic. Is, 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 it, is, it, what, is it painted down on the bottom, the black part or is that charred or what is that? No, it's actually a void. It's a void in the wood. So you're seeing the background through it. Yes. Oh, and then you've got paint, like glossy paint, but well, beneath it. No, no, oh. actually that's just the, um, the background that I shot it on, I think is kind of, oh. yeah, it's kind of coming through there a little bit, but yeah, there's no paint so on it's, it. But it's, 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 in shadow. it's in shadow, in other words. Yes. And yes. then is that, is that string that's going up, crisscrossing up there? It's wire. Wire, okay. Mm -hmm. It's a very wow. thin, thin wire that's in, so the whole thing is in tension. The pieces, the glass is actually free floating. So it's just held in tension on there. Well, it's quite powerful. I mean, Thank it's, you. Uh, it stabs oneself away. I mean, it's, uh, it stabs into the heart and asks a question to me. Um, Maybe the, maybe the red is almost like blood in a way. You've got this very pure aquamarine hue. You've got then this void with this sharp, you know, appendage coming out of it. And then you've got this suggestion of viscera. I don't know. To me, it's just, uh, it's, it's enrapturing and disturbing at the same time. I like the darkness that, uh, somehow this suggests sort of subliminally, very complicated piece to me to look at. Uh, full. Thank you, thank you. And thanks for including it in the show. I love the show, it's beautiful. I like it too. I was very impressed with everything, so cool. Wow. All right, well, everyone, um... Thank you all. I will forward the link once this is uh, once this is posted. I'll forward the link to everyone. And in the meantime, I welcome any feedback, any suggestions how we could do this better next year. Um, I'm wide open. So thank you all again. 
And everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Kaz and Richard and everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good job. That was wonderful. Great job. Congratulations to everybody. This has been so enriching and just so heartfelt. I'm just very pleased. And knowing where different people are, like St. Louis and different areas uh, farther afield. Uh, I'm just, I know, just, I don't know. I, this, that we've come together and discussed all of these different ideas and processes and everything to me is there's a specialness to that 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 I just savor. Um, so thanks everybody and uh, my uh, please keep me updated on your work. My email address is richardspear at gmail.com. My uh, website is richardspear.com. I have some of my work, my writing. I mean. Um, and so I would love to, you know, periodically a new series or something that you'd like me to shoot me some JPEGs of or whatever. Love to see what all of you are up to as time goes on. So uh, it's a real privilege to have with you this evening. So Chaz, thanks again for giving us all this opportunity. Wonderful. All right, everybody. Have a great evening.